Hi, I'm Briggs. I'm Mingus. I run crack. If you can, pass the cracking contest. Uh, and I'm boy number one in Coralogic. Thanks for coming. Uh, that's a machine of mine running dual 6990s submerged in mineral oil. Cracks full blast and runs at 60 degrees uh, Celsius at all times. I can't see what I'm doing on my screen. This is an actual video of the machine being dropped into the tank. Uh, it's a minute long, bear with me. It's the scariest damn thing I've ever done, knowing that I have a machine and it's about to be submerged in liquid. It's pretty close to dust me, actually. Yeah. Anyways, that's then it, it runs. <laughs> scary, scary, scary. Okay, uh, I can't see what I'm doing, so. In Keynote, how do you go full screen? Uh, hit the play button. That's screwed, I was doing this. Drop your screen resolution so you can see everything. Yeah, I'm just not a Mac when you so. Hmm. I'll sit like that, it's fine. Okay, I'm really sweaty because I just forgot my laptop and had to run back to the Palms and then run back here. Okay, so we're talking about uh, kind of, uh, cracking corporate passwords. So I'm a penetration tester. I got into password cracking because I'm a penetration tester, and so therefore I needed to crack passwords, but I always needed to do it better. Because I've been doing it since 99, and the default was, oh, I'm going to run John and default rule sets and use its CHR files. It's, you know, it's basic brute forcing, and I'm like, oh, look, I'm cracking passwords. But then it got to be like, you know, hey, I'm seeing patterns. How do I do it? Okay, so I want to start writing John rules. Well, how the heck do you do that? I remember this is 10 years ago. So that's sort of how I got into it. Uh, I created Crack Me If You Can, stop by our table at the DEF CON area, and I've got an entire suitcase full of uh, free shirts for everybody. I'll hand them out later. Uh, if you don't get one, I've got about 200 more coming to DEF CON. So, okay, so what we're talking about here is password policies, because I want you to uh, be cynical about them, okay? So uh, the purpose, obviously, is to make people's passwords in enterprise be stronger, okay? So that's the theory, and everyone does it, and everyone trusts it. So that's the whole idea. Now we've proved over the last years, everyone in this room, that passwords on the internet suck. Thank you, paste them. Thank you, all the, you know, all the anonymous ding dongs that leak all this stuff. Hey, we've proved that. We've proved that people from random internet sites choose random passwords, and they suck. Now we're all learning from them. I mean, we're all getting new, new words, new root words, we're finding new patterns and the thing. But the thing to remember is almost all of these sites don't do password complexity. Now some of them are slowly improving. When you go to the enterprise world, 100% of places are doing, are doing password policy. So uh, in, in the best example, the best data that you have, if you're not a penetration tester, is the LinkedIn list. Now, we've gotten the 90% crack in the LinkedIn list, and that's fine. But were the passwords chosen for LinkedIn more, uh, more complex than they were on, say, last.fm or Rocky? Well, yes, they were. Were they harder to crack? Well, not kind of, but not really. I mean, we're still at 90%, or whatever percentage of people are at now, 92, I think, is roughly what it is. So my point about LinkedIn is the people who use LinkedIn, it's not 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds and it's not on some forum. It's enterprise people, it's business people. It's people like me. I mean, I have an account. My, my password was leaked. And then I, 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 I put out a Twitter, there was my password, go crack it. It's 20 characters, it's random public. It's already out there, I already changed it. And it's unique to that one site. So people like me have accounts there, okay? so. The, the, the complexity requirements that people are used to in the enterprise world or the business world or whatever you want to call it, they went and used it on LinkedIn. So you can use LinkedIn, you can learn things from it. The point of this talk is all those password complexity, uh, you know, rules and, and things that people have to follow, it introduces risk. It makes things easier to crack if you use it. So, so what kind of stuff? Okay, so what I have access to is since I'm a penetration tester, I, I mean, you know, I do all the basement stuff because it's fun and it's fun to laugh at everybody, but I have access to huge enterprise directories, Fortune 50, Fortune 100, or we're talking 200,000 users, 300,000 users, uh, even more, of people who 100% of them have to meet password complexity. So that's sort of a different data set than you usually see, you know, on the internet. So usually, you know, it's like length eight, you gotta have three out of four categories of upper lower special digit, you have to have three of the four. Okay, pretty standard stuff. So, 
uh, the .gov world or DOD or whatever you want to call it, you know, more and more places are 12, 2, 2, 2, 2. So you have to be length 12, have to have two upper, have to have two special, have to have two digit, have to have two, whichever one I didn't say, uh, upper. Anyways, you get the point. Okay, so these are the rules that they have to follow. They're still humans. Humans are still stupid, as are users. So let's take advantage of that. But how? And that's what I kind of want to show you. So uh, in a lot of places, I'm starting to see, like if they have enterprise admins or domain admins, they have stronger policies than other places. Okay, well, let's take advantage of that. So and the other big thing is that I have access to in my work and that other people do is password histories. You compromise a domain, you have the last six passwords, you have the last 15 passwords. That is extremely useful as a penetration tester, but even more useful as a password researcher because they're forced to change their password every three months. They're humans. They can't remember. Every three months, they're not going to remember a random 12-character string. They are going to change a little thing in their password, and they don't think anyone's going to see their secrets. But meanwhile, I come along, and I've got 12 history, or six history, or three history for them, and I can use that. If I crack an old one, I can change my tactic and crack the new one without having to go and just shoot at it blindly. Okay. The other big good thing is that a lot of times these are NTLMs, which is the fastest hash format to crack. Thank you, Microsoft. So that makes it things a lot easier. Now, at other times, a lot of times it's giant LDAP or SSO, single sign on, uh, and those are salted shots and those stuff. But if you, the same passwords live in Active Directory, so then you can go and crack them in the single sign on world. Okay, so then, like I said, most of them are dumb, you know, 200,000 users. So what do I see? So here's what I'm going to do I'm going to tell you about the stuff you already know, and then I'm going to show you stuff, and then I'm going to tell you stuff you already know as well, but with a twist. So, so what do I say? Okay, so date-based. We all know people use date-based passwords. Summer 13, okay? I just ran from the poems. It's definitely summer. Uh, okay, well, yeah, we know people use that. It, well, well, take Rock U, take Last FM. How many people used it there? What was the percentage? Now, go to an enterprise where you force them to change their password every three months. What's the percentage that Summer 13 is going to work? I mean, it could be 10% of the users have that as a password. You. You're forcing them to change their password every three months. In most places, every three months, the seasons change. Not repair, but it's just winter. But, <laughs> uh, you know, but other places, you know, they have um, seasons. And so therefore, that's an easy thing for them to remember. Okay, and it's going to kill. Um, so 90-day rotations introduces seasons. Okay, if you do, if, what, what do you think happens if you force rotation every month? What month is it? You know, I know a really great 12 character password. It's September 13th, you know. Oh, you make have a, a, a special character? Exclamation point on the end. Okay. Now, we already know this. This is not rocket science stuff, but I'm, what I'm saying is in the enterprise, in the business world, this just kills. Kills, kills, kills. So it's right there. Kills, kills, kills. So does this sort of policy, does this sort of attack work on Rock U or the last FM leaks, you know, the big leaks? Well, yeah, it cracks some passwords. But what's the percentage? It's going to be really low, so it might just seem like a, yeah, 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 I know that tactic, they will up. You're not telling me anything new. I'm telling you, an enterprise gets destroyed. Okay. So rotational policies introduce this vulnerability. It introduces a challenge to the user. Users do not like that. They are going to invent ways to bypass this. Okay. Well, there is keyboard patterns. Big whoop. We know about keyboard patterns. Well, so. I've been to places where they, they, they have new user training and they tell people, look, dude, seriously, you can't use the name of the company and your password, you need to have all, it needs to be random. And so in some, some places, we'll tell people about keyboard patterns, okay? A lot of times, if you make a, you know, a, a, a Windows admin, pick a 12-character password, they got to type in a thousand times a day, you know, they're not using LastPass or whatever, like, you know, they're going to make some, some keyboard pattern. So it's really easy these days with modern tools to combine two word lists. And then that's probably the best way to crack passwords for that match keyboard patterns. Uh, you, you know, using the built-in one and John at the external rule just blows. Okay, so uh, there, you know, so obviously you have a left list, you have a right list. Bam, you're cracking 12 character .gov compliant passwords. You know, it's no big deal. Uh, what we started to see is people realize that, and so they're starting to do things like doing a password and then adding something at the end. So don't forget that. Use, use your combination rules, combine your left and your right key, uh, keyboard patterns, and then run rules against it. Okay. And, and, and it can be the standard simple rules, add a year at the end, add a number at the end, you know, things like that. But I started to see other things where you have the left and the right and then bam, to put things in the middle. 
special character in the middle because they're like, aha, this, this makes it so you can't figure out my fingerprint. So, now, the, the main thing in red there is the finger patterns aren't just three letter, three letter. They're not four letter, four letter, okay? They can be two four letter combinations. You know, they can be two five letter, they can be three four. So it can be QWER, ASDF, ZXCC. That's a three times four, okay? So there's all these different combinations. Uh, so, so the person who gave the talk about uh, you know, detecting keyboard patterns, you have to think about every one of these. Uh, uh, dead one's in the room somewhere, and he, uh, he has a pull script on his website that actually is aware of all these different combinations, and you can go in and say, okay, I want to do a four by three. So you figure out a user is doing four three character packs. Um, so it, 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 in combinator mode, it's really easy to do it, or you can pipe the standard in. John, question for it. How common is it to see users doing like a four character pattern and then a three character pattern or something? Or do you normally see them using the same uh, same cycle length? Right. The question is, you know, how often do you see like four then three as opposed to them doing four by four? It's not as common, but like uh, where I do see it is like if they're you know, if they're storing their password on DDS, it's chopped at eight. A lot of times they'll do a three, three, and then add two characters. It's less common, and that's why, like, this works, but then you have to apply your rules to the output of all those different combinations. So what I do is I take Dead One's Perl script uh, and actually make the dictionaries, and the dictionaries are static, and then you just use those static dictionaries that are just freaking huge. Use those in combination with rules. Okay. So, um, so here's a bunch of real passwords from Active Domain controllers from you know Fortune 50, Fortune 100 companies. Okay, so it's pretty standard stuff. You know, when you start looking at the ones, the ones I highlighted. I mean, everyone in this room can look at it. You know, but like the top one is is a four by five. So it's a 20 character password. That's a pretty darn good password. You know, go ahead and try to brute 20 character Salted Shaw brute force. You know, but it's a four by five. Standard stuff. You start to see some other ones, uh, you know, the, the dollar, QWER, QWER in caps. And a lot of these, you know, you can look at that and say DOD compliant, DOD compliant, DOD compliant. I don't know what that term is, but you can look at that and, and easily see what's compliant for the larger ones. So those are all written. Um, and, and it wasn't for a company named QWER. <laughs> okay, so why I'm on the subject now, keep in mind, I'm still in the telling you stuff you already know category. Okay? So keep in mind, double list, this is getting more and more common for long passwords if you're active your domain. If, you're, if your enterprise admins have to have 12 characters, they are going to invent methods. So combining of two words, and this is something we did in the last track, if you can, we put a lot of combining of two words. Okay, you require two upper cases. Well, I'm going to capitalize each word. You require specials. Where, if someone's doing a combination of two words or two things, where are they going to put the special character? Well, usually they put it at the end. Sometimes they put it at the beginning, but in this case, there's a lot of time it's in the middle. The same thing, it's the same stupid rules of leading a word. Well, it's still a combination of two words, but each of the word is leaded. So those are all relatively real. I, I you know, I kind of changed a few of them to, to uh, you know, Professor Redmond's not real. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea of, of, of the other techniques in advanced situations that people are using. Now, you'll see these on the last FM stuff, but once you start requiring 12 characters, you really can start start seeing these. Okay, so where's the number? Okay, we're jumping. I'm really fast. We're just jumping, jumping, jumping. So where's the number? So if you require a digit, where's that digit going to be 90% of the time? It's going to be at the end. Okay, so every one of your, you know, every you see, if you look at the fall rules of any tool, and it's always going to be at the number at the end. So. Well, some of them are going to be at the beginning, and that's fine. So if you require a special character, where are they, you know, where are they going to put it? They're going to put it at the end. This is standard stuff, okay? And all the tools relatively do this. But as soon as you keep that in mind, and then as soon as you ask yourself, well, what if you require, okay, I require a, a number of cards special, but I also require an upper. Well, then what are they going to do? Where are they going to put their upper? They're going to capitalize the first word, or, excuse me, the first letter. Well, if you look at John's default rules, it's got things like, oh, add 2012, add 2013. But there's no C with that rule. So, you know, it could be password 13, but it's going to try password in lowercase. So either your word lists have to have that, or you have to go in and change the rules and put a C in there. Or you use hashtag and you combine the rules. So you use your standard rule set, whatever it is, and you just say, oh, also use, use the cat rule. Okay. So there is an order to where they put them and which special characters and which numbers. So what's the most popular special character in password? Exclamation point. 
Okay, what's the least popular one that I see? Uh, the British pound sign, because only people with that on the keyboard can use it. So, but it's an inter if it's an international company, they're going to have things like that. So there's an order to where they're placed and which characters they use. Now, we come along, we run John or, or, or something like that, or we run a brute force. But do the tools know this? I mean, if you're using John, you use the, the static CHR files that come with it. Is it using this? Does it, is it, does it do it the best way? I don't have an answer for that. Okay? So just keep that in mind that if you go and, like, if I'm brute forcing, like, blowfish, okay? Or, you know, dollar six dollars, so it's going to be hard as heck. I'm not going to do a, you know, a question A, question A, question A, and then question S for special. You know, because it's like, oh no, that's going to take bloody forever. I'm going to go and say, just do the exclamation point at the end. So, um, so we talked a little bit about rotation. So as soon as you enforce rotation, you're introducing vulnerability. Okay. So users will use the same root word, which is just like a term I, I made up. You know, they're going to have the same root word, and they're going to change their specials. They're going to change their digits. Maybe they'll change their capitalization or something like that. Okay. As soon as you learn the root word of a user, you can then go and target it. And that really helps in penetration tests when you're doing like Microsoft cache credentials. You get one from a year ago, I figure out the root word, oh wait, it's a river in India. I'm going to go and just make that river in India be my word, try all my rules against it. But, so the users will use the same habits, the same topologies every time. I mean, it's a standard. And that's what you get from password history is that you don't get from just getting a static list from a single site that's been owned. So, so things like Smith Wesson 12, Smith Wesson 13, Smith Wesson 14. So what's going to be the next password? He's okay. So users wouldn't do this if you didn't force them to do it. Okay, because they don't think any, you know, they don't think anyone knows their secret trick. But but their their secret tricks are pretty stupid. So anyway, so all of this is old news. That's nothing. This is all default stuff. We all kind of know about it. We can all tune our tools to do all this. Uh, we, you know, back in the 2010, I released a whole bunch of rules that were based on these kind of ideas. You know, all my rules were all like the very first thing was cap, cap everything because you know, 80 percent of the time in enterprise, it's going to be that first letter's capitalized. Just, it's just, it just, you know, take every rule you have, add C to it at the very beginning, and go from there because that's going to kill an enterprise. Uh, as soon as someone comes along and capitalizes the second letter, you know, a password and makes it a capital A instead of a capital P, it's like gobs harder, just because they're not doing something that's trivial to us. Obviously, it is trivial, trivial to us. We can do a T1 and, and whatever. So uh, some other cool things that are going on, this guy Marcus, he runs a site for Red Asian. You can go there and he wants your money. Um, but you go, you specify a company, a company name, they do a bunch of Google, and then pull out a bunch of words from like Wikipedia and from the company's websites of where that company is located, where uh, what that company does, and like words from their website. Because if I'm going to go work, uh, do a pen test, or I'm going to go target a company, and the company I'm going to target is, let's say, Target. Okay, well, what does Target sell? What do they make? Where are their offices? Oh, their corporate office is in Poughkeepsie. Okay, well, we'll put you know, you need to use Poughkeepsie in your work list. Okay, because that kills an enterprise. Kills, kills, kills. If your client is in a location. You use that location, you use that location's sports teams, things like that. It absolutely destroys. It's like using the word last or last FM to crack the last FM list, or using the word rock or rock you and rock you list. Same exact idea. It's, it's, it's not rocket science stuff, okay? Um, create your own Markov chains. If you're a John user and you're just using A.chr, you're missing tons of stuff that's based on Solar's word lists from gobs. You know, who knows? I mean, I asked him, like, hey, why don't we update this? And he's like, it is based on my research. It is, you know, oh crap, we're streaming, are we? Um, <laughs> nah, he looks far away from So anyway, so make your own based upon your data set because, you know, and even if your data set's small, or make your own Markov chains, whether it's in John or, or in, in Hash Category like that, that are based on what you're seeing. Because as soon as you bring in your all.chr from John and you're going after 12 to 2 passwords, it's just not going to work. You're just wasting your time. That's, you know, that's illogical. It's all about using logic. Okay, so users are human. The types of users will, 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 what am I trying to say? It will affect how, what their password selection is, okay? Companies have a finite amount of types of users, 
Okay? They got Unix leanies, they got Mac nerds, they got Windows idiots, they yeah. got janitors, they got executives, they got marketing, they got salespeople. Okay? It's pretty standard across the board. Okay? And then they have various levels of the types of users. Uh, if a company outsources to India or has a large percentage of Indian employees, you know, which is common in some places, uh, or pick other country, guess what you should use for work lists? The best example I have is on this pen test. It's actually a really challenging one. I, I had a blast with it. I eventually, via Mimicats, got an enterprise admin's uh, password. I dumped it out of memory. Um, and it was two words, just both of them capitalized, pumps together with a number in the middle, and both of them were two locations in India. So I actually would have cracked it because I have a large India work list just from Wikipedia, um, and, but it's just two crazy long words that meant nothing to me. I had to Google them, and one of them was like a river, and the other one was uh, you know, like some small village. It means nothing to us. It's a really easy long word for them to remember. So. Um, so obviously having lists of names, you know, the Facebook main list that was uh, about two years ago by someone in this room, um, you know, but match them to your target, okay? So uh, pretty standard stuff. Uh, White Pro Centel, has anyone ever heard of these companies? Uh, you know, you, you go to a place and they'll have 500 or 200 White Pro consultants, White Pro consultants. Uh, you know what's the funny thing about all of them? Every one of them has White Pro in their password. So you can go to a place, and it's real easy to find out if their eight character password is white pro one two three or white pro thirteen exclamation point. The same with whoever Centel is. All it's almost like all their employees do that. Now, do you see that in Last.fm or Rock U or LinkedIn? No, you don't. But I'm telling you, it'll crack a significant percentage. Okay, so patterns. So what's new? Patterns. Everyone's been talking about patterns. We know about patterns. If you're John Dewey's tough cookies. But like in Hashpad or whatever, so obviously patterns aren't new, okay? Uh, you can use them standard in. So, but I want to show you how critical they are for enterprise, okay? Because keep in mind, we talk about cracking ETL and that's fine, it's super fast, but what if you're cracking even salted shaws from an LBAT database? You know, the big long salted shaw with SSHA uh, in, in the brackets. You, 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 you can't just brute force. You got five days, you have to be, you have to use strategery. So, so obviously, you know, I mean, like the best example is upper, lower, 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 lower digit, and, and that's it in hashtag format there. So, you know, on a system with four 7970s, it costs about $1,600, $2,000, takes five seconds, okay? So as opposed to doing a, a, you know, an eight character brute force, you can start with that one pattern in five seconds, crack things. So obviously, I mean, these are just basic examples. We all know this, upper, lower, 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 lower digit, cracks things like Austin 13, exclamation point. Okay, big whoop, this is not a tutorial. But the thing is, these patterns are universal, in quotes, between different enterprise networks. Just like there's just like there's somewhat universal, you know, the last FM list or the Rock U list uh, or other big lists that you have. I mean, they're somewhat universal. Six character low, you know, that cracking for a year old password would be easy. In an enterprise, every enterprise has to be all their users have to be password complexity. If you figure out the patterns used in those kind of environments, they're going to be different than what you're used to seeing. They will destroy. They will destroy. So, um, I haven't seen until just the other day password complexity checks that are aware of this and then prevent people from choosing passwords regardless of what the word is based solely on placement of where you put things. So, if it's an obvious word, special character, that's the kind of thing that we need to prevent. And so we're working on it, it looks like someone else is already working on it, things like that. So the type of root words, because we're all about word lists, oh, I got this insane word list, I got a great word list, is actually starting to be a little less relevant. Now I still use them still, I mean, I, I still disagree with my own statement, but uh, it's no longer the most important toolbox. I mean, if you, can, if you know to do upper, low, 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 lower digit, for you make it eight characters, and you know that cracks 15% of 200,000 users, that's better than any word list. Because what if their pattern is still just a random gobbledygook word, but it meets that pattern? And that pattern runs in four seconds. So, no public, no in quotes obviously, no public leak is from large corporate networks. I mean, think about the big leaks. You see, not every once in a while you'll see like a few hundred NTLMs pop up on Pastebin. And they're from a single place, and I get all excited. Woo, oh, look, man, man, okay. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, you know, you think of every big leak you've seen, none of them are from these environments, okay? And very few of them are from sites that enforce complexity that would introduce this vulnerability, 
Okay, so all this research and everything like that, like building your word list after you ask for doing all this research and finding all these links, that's super beneficial for finding root words, but it's not super beneficial for finding the patterns. So, okay, so some other ones. So obviously, you know, an A character in TLA, you know, it can crack in hours or days, you know. You can do it in six hours, I can do it in four days. Uh, with a signal machine, it takes, you know, so long like that. But, okay, well, what about nine characters? What if, what if, what if they require nine characters? Well, that's going to take weeks. Now, as researchers, we have weeks, but as a penetration tester, I got five days, okay? So I can't brute force that. And what if they're salted shot? You know, I, I, I mean, brute force them that. So immediately, as soon as we start thinking about nine character passwords with complexity requirements, these patterns become real important. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you how that, how, how that is. So like, you know, to give you an example, you can crack half of the nine character passwords just by using simple patterns. Okay? Now you crack a bunch with your word lists and your rules and things like that, but but doing that in a few days versus trying to brute force is, is, is so much faster. So these are the most popular enterprise nine character passwords. And this is just so obvious to everyone in the room. Upper, lower, 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 digit. Okay, it has three to four, it's three to four patterns, it's more than eight digits, pretty standard stuff. So these are all, this is all, you know, kind of what we're used to saying. Not rocket science stuff. And that's kind of my point, this isn't rocket science. It's, it's, this is all pretty simple stuff. So, let, let me show you some real data. I mean, since I have actions, I am a penetration tester, since I do do this, let me show you what we actually do see. So, a very, very large company, very large, makes a lot of money and a lot of products that everyone consumes in this room. So, 100% of their passwords meet complexity requirements. Okay, so none of them are password lowercase. Okay, so, uh, in this case, we cracked, you know, almost all of them. Thanks, Wayne, man. You know, so it was a really good research. So it's 263,000 uh, users, not hashes. So we found 7,300 7, patterns. Okay, well, third. And so you start thinking about the most popular patterns. Uh, there's the eight character pattern. It's just a word, uppercase at the very beginning, with two digits at the end. It's 12%. 12% of their hashes meet that one pattern. How long does that one pattern take to crack? About five seconds. Okay? So then, the second most popular one is nine characters. So the second most popular, I'm just gonna repeat myself, but anyways, it's 12% as well, okay? And then going on down, you can see the numbers go like that. So out of the 263,000, we identified 7,000 topologies, patterns, okay? That's all that means. So 3,000 of them, roughly, were used more than once. Okay, so the other ones were one-offs, good for them. So the most popular one was used 33,000. It's 12% of, of the hashes. Okay, so obviously that's important. The top five, so just the first five patterns you identify, it got 127,000 cracks and it's 48%. So you think about NTLM, you know, it, it wouldn't take you that long to get 50%, okay? It just wouldn't. But, you know, that's if you're NTLM. What if you're salt and chunk? What if you're DES? Uh, what if you're dollar one dollar? What if your $2a dollar? What if your $6a or $6a? $6, you know? What if you're in these harder ones? You have to be more specific in your ideas. So you take the top, <clears throat> top 100 patterns. You put those in a list, you run those. It cracks 225,000 out of 263. So just with 100 commands. And in this particular instance, we cracked 85% 80, of the passwords. Using no rules, no word lists, just patterns. Now I'm not saying that words and, and, and rules are, are wordless because they're not. They're super, super important. But so how long does it take to run a hundred patterns? Well, it you know, depends on the hash format, but not very long. I mean, you know. And the thing is with this, remember I said these patterns are somewhat universal. You go to one Fortune 50, you go to the other, you're gonna see roughly the same kind of pattern. Because there's no enterprise tool that prevents patterns. There's enterprise tools that enforce complexity, but don't you know say, hey, 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 that's an obvious word digit special, you know. Um, so, you know, it, 85, getting 85, getting 80 percent used to kind of be like the magic number. That's when I started to feel like, okay, I feel pretty good about myself. It used to take weeks. I mean, 10 years ago, you know, I had John on a, on a maybe a tool card, you know, but you know, but now. This is so fast to do. Just by doing 100 patterns and I don't even have to think about it. Like I can, 
Like, hey mom, go run this these hundred commands and you'll crack 85 percent of the passwords of the Fortune 50. You know. Okay. Well, let's talk about a second example. So this is another example. This is a large single sign-on, not NTLM, salted shops, slow as dirt to crack. Could be worse, could be better. Now they had password history, six per each one. Well, that is just pure data. That's great for me. Okay, so it is 449,000 real people, so big company, and we got, you know, for almost 420,000 of them cracked in a certain amount of time, uh, and we found, you know, this many patterns. Notice it's more patterns uh, than the previous example. So the most popular patterns are there, they're all pretty obvious, they almost all start with the word, have digits on the end, or digit, digit special, or four digits, or, you know, they, they have a word special than four digits. So the, the least popular pattern is this got all of so the first five patterns at this place that I don't even have to think about and I can just run them, crack 16%, you know? So, out of the 449,000, we got 14,000 topologies, okay? About 7,500 were used more than once, so obviously they're useful. So the single most popular pattern, it cracked 4.3%. Now that's less than the other example, so we're going somewhere. The top five patterns, was used 72,000, which is 16%. So just by running five commands, I can easily crack 16.2, okay? Now remember, it's a salted shop, not NTLM, so I really need to use more strategy to, to be actually smarter in my attacks. So the top 100 patterns, so if I can run 100, you know, if I can say, mom, go run these 100 patch cat commands, uh, you know, you can get 60, 62%. Of the, of the domain crack. Now, you notice the previous example was 85. So which place has better passwords? Well, based on patterns, it's this. In this place, that's better, okay? Now, you know, better is in quotes. I mean, it's obviously, it's all, uh, you know, it's, it's up in the air or whatever. But anyways, that gives you an example of how, how important patterns can be, okay? Now, we all know about hacks, but, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing new. It's nothing new, but it's like, you know, before John came, or before Hashcat really came around, it was like I was doing this stuff where I'd have a C program, spit out these patterns, and then type the John standard in. I mean, that's the way it used to be done 10 years ago. You know, you had to write custom code. Well, now, you know, you don't have to do that. You can do it on command line. You can automate all this. So let me tell you how we do it. You, learning all of this, learning that, hey, the types of words that people are using from word lists, the types of rules we're seeing, you, we sort our rules based on the most uh, the ones that crack the most results. So it's not just a giant list of rules, it's they're all, we've done the research, done the math, and we sort them based upon how good they work. So if, you know, you start looking at them from the top down, they look, but they're based on previous results. Because enterprise to enterprise to enterprise to enterprise, to Fortune 50 to Fortune 50 to Fortune 100, it's the same kind of people. There's Unix wings, there's Max nerds, there's, there's janitors, there's Unix users, you know. So anyways, okay, so warning, sales pitch. So our tactic is, I, I want to crack these. I want to crack them on a large scale. I want to crack them on a lot of machines. But I don't want to have all the machines in a room and have them be on infinite band and have them do VCL. Okay? It's just not what, not what I'm going to do. It's not, I don't have that situation. What I do have is GPUs all over the country in people's houses and various cobos and things like that. So what we do is we share the hash list between all the machines. Okay, so every machine gets the hash list. Now you gotta make sure you do it securely. All our hard drives are encrypted, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and then when you're done, you delete it so that you're not putting these hashes at risk. You share the word lists, you know? So you have a central place where all your word lists are, you share them between all the machines. The same with your rules. If you make a custom rule, you put it on one machine, it's distributed to all the other machines, it's therefore used the next time they do that. That's a dynamic process, it changes, it's in flux. If you figure out a new type of rule, word or a new type of rule that totally destroys, you put it in a centralized place and send to all the other machines in the grid. So you create a queue of jobs to run. So what jobs am I going to run? So, so backing up for a second, what's the goal here? The goal here is for me to press a button and to crack 85% of an active directory domain without thinking. And that frees my brain up. I don't have to think. I can go and do this and crack a large percentage and then I can concentrate on my job whether that job's penetration testing, or my job is knowing, uh, hey, let's not even try for those easy ones, let's try for the hard ones. So I've got my own GPU that's not in the grid, and I can go and use my brain. Now at the same time, we've got 300, 400 CPU cores doing the same thing, and they're all doing their things logically as well. 
So I can hit a button, everything can go, it can go and automate it, it's done by logic, it's not, done, it's not brute force. No, I can do it brute force, but it's done by logic. Now half the people in this room are going, bullshit, you can't automate what I do. You know, that doesn't make any sense. You know, you can't, no, this is a science, this is an art. Uh, you know, but the thing is, I've got 300 cores, you know, CPU cores, and I've got, you know, I only have like 10 or 12 GPU cores now, but that's going to grow. So if I go and I buy another four GPU machine and put it in, I don't have to go and manage it, it's going to manage itself, okay? So you create a queue of jobs to run, and that the, the queue is based on what we've seen in different enterprises. So the, the very first job I run, what is it going to be? Well, it's going to be the most popular from other companies, the most popular genre, uh, most popular command to run, whether that's a word list and rule set, or whether that's one of these keyword patterns, or one of it, or maybe it's a, a topology pattern, things like that. So you make a list of these, you know, and as it goes down through the list, they get a little more common. Like the word list is like rivers in India, and, and the rules you're using are some obscure rule that you've seen once or twice randomly, things like that. You, you put them there, a GPU says, hey, I'm not cracking, give me a job. It sends its job, it runs it, it uploads its results. It says, hey, I'm free, give me another one, okay? That's being done on, you know, 10 machines, 20 machines, 400 machines, all across the internet. You know, I mean, you know, insert long discussion here about the protocols and how we use private keys to make sure that anyone can do that. So essentially, I can scale this infinitely. And just any machine, you know, anyone in this room want to be a client? Here, run this, and then you're part of a grid, and you're not just helping a brute force. You're not running part of a VCL job. You know, you're not even using all the track, uh, you know, bandwidth. So, as you go, the hash list shrinks. Now, that's not super important for NTLM, but you start thinking about these salted shots, and you're starting with 300,000 hashes. Well, after a while, you're 80% cracked. All right, well, what's 20% of 300,000? Okay, well, 10% of the So now you're down to 60,000. Well, that's a lot less salts. So you're being smart, you're being faster. You're going to crack smart. Uh, you shrink it as you go, new machines, blah, 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 centralized monitors, and all that. Now, there's no VCL, there's no location requirements, there's no special hardware. Uh, we have a new employee, we ship them out. Here's a free PC, by the way, it's got a 7990 in it, we'll give you 50 bucks a month for power. Uh, and by the way, it's going to be screaming hot 24-7 and you're not going to know why. <laughs> well, you're going to know why. Um, you know, or we set it up to say, okay, well, at 6 p.m., theoretically, the person's done working, that's when it starts up and does jobs. So it cracks from 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. and, you know, we've got flexible things. Now, theoretically, you can go and fire up an Amazon EC2 GPU cluster and run the jobs there. Now, we'd never do that. Why the heck would you send your hashes to a third party? That doesn't take security seriously. So, you know, you talk about Moxie running the thing for 20 bucks and he uses a word list. Great. And he says right there, I, oh, I run this on an Amazon EC2 cluster. Well, good thing those things are super secure. Okay, so, so how, do we, how do we improve? Okay? So, it, so anyway, the reason that's a sales pitch is because you know, we're going to start selling this to our clients as a service, okay? And that's our general idea. But I wanted to sort of talk, you know, I'm not going to sell to you all. You have money, look at you. <laughs> but, uh, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of how you can distribute work and do it in a logical manner. So how do we improve? Well, create policies, password policies, in enterprise environments that are aware of this that are aware that these five patterns can lead to 60% crackage. That'll work. Okay, now if someone showed off something that's starting to do that, and that's great. Now get it rolled into an enterprise. Now get it rolled into SiteMinder. Please, SiteMinder, SiteMinder. If you don't know SiteMinder, it's used everywhere. It's real expensive. Um, you know, have it rolled into single sign-on. Have it rolled into PAM modules on Unix. Have it rolled into Active Directory. Have it be a module, things like that, because I've proven that regardless of words, regardless of rules, you can take five command lines and in some cases crack this huge amount. So those things, but it's really unpopular. So yeah, so we're working on a solution, uh, and you know, but you know, someone else has already got a working solution. So the, 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 my thing is I give this talk to techies and to managers and stuff like that, say, so, dude, your, your password complexity, it doesn't work. It, it introduces things. Okay, so that's the basic idea for my talk. Uh, some, some other little things, just because I think I have a few minutes. Uh, I run GPU some, some, uh, submerged oil. It's a crazy idea. I just, I did it. And I'm going to keep doing it. So I'm going to buy 20 Euro racks, basically, and fill it with uh, four 7970s. They're all going to be submerged in oil. 
Uh, you have to do a few little things like you solid state drive. You have to remove the fans uh, and the heat sinks from the cards, scrape off that silica, like do whatever it's called, the, you know, the stuff. And you have to replace it with a piece of like the special aluminum foil and you put the heat sink back on. No fans. You use less power because you're using less fans. And a big 4U chassis with all those you know, 150 CFM fans, you're not using any of those. So theoretically, your, your power usage goes down. So therefore, your Colo, wherever, charges you less. Mm. Yeah. Uh, my, my machine that installs submerged oil is dual 6990s that were overheating in the air. They were hit 90 degrees Celsius immediately. And regardless of how many fans I put on them, now they run at 60 degrees Celsius 24 hours a day and they're fully utilized at all times. I don't even think about them. I don't even know the machine's in oil. I have no idea. Uh, will it last long term? We'll see. Uh, change your last item password again. Uh, so crack me, so crack me if you can. I got a few minutes. I'll talk briefly about crack me if you can. Um, it's, it's bigger this year. We have seven people working on it. Um, five will be at DEF CON. Uh, we have street teams. So the pro teams are competing for my hard earned money, uh, $1,000 in cash. But street teams, you know, you're not going to be competing against the pro guys. You'll have your own little category. Smaller teams, I don't care. You don't have to be at DEF CON so your friends can play at home. Uh, and there's going to be like lower prizes for the street team, so it's not like you versus the big guys. You can compete with the little guys. Well, we're going to do door prizes this year. Like every every hour, we're going to publish a hash at our desk, and the first person to crack it, you know, wins a you know a T-shirt or wins a poem plug or you know, wins whatever our little prizes are. So it's kind of a benefit. So that way, the people can kind of get involved and. Because we like when we're sitting there, we'll have university students come up and be like, oh dude, I've got a cluster of like a thousand machines at home, you know, or at, at my university, it's just sitting there. And so we wanted to kind of reward those kind of guys. Um, two other things an online uh, petition to dissolve NTLM. I think we're the community to do that. Uh, I don't think they'll ever do that. But getting the word out that it blows is, is a good idea. And the other thing is like, the big reason I started Crack Me If You Can was because it was started kind of as a, as a dare. Uh, one of my founders of my company, uh, Hank, if, you, if people know him from Crack Me If You Can, was like, if we ever meet someone who can write John River rules and can understand them, we have to hire them because that means they're smarter than us. Okay? And, you know, that was years ago. So, 10 years ago, how many people could write John River rules? You know, how many people could write them and then have Solar not rewrite them and then berate you? <laughs> you know, because still, I write him and he's still like in the comments, he's like, uh, I don't know why they did this. I don't know why I came from that accent. I can't do a Russian accent. Uh, yeah, cross me uh, So, I mean, how many people were at that level? How many people were at that level 10 years ago? How many people were at that level five years ago? Now, we've got a room full of us. Look at us. We're all sitting together. We can all do it. We can all understand it. I can talk about doing a T1 rule and half the people who yeah, yeah, I talk, I know, you know. I, I really like the way the community is going. There wasn't a community before. I mean, there was mailing lists of people on how the hell we're doing this, you know. So I think it's a, I think it's good because we're you know we're proving to people and proving to enterprises and proving to hack sites that are getting owned about the importance of using proper hashing mechanisms, which is just like boring. It's a snore fest for me, but people weren't getting burned on it before. Last out of them still uses raw ND5. They now they compromise it twice. They didn't change their hashing between the first and second compromise. Uh, uh, if LinkedIn got owned again, would they still have Shaw? You know, no, you know. So it's our community that's going to get this out. It's going to get the, the word out there to help enterprises improve what they're doing, help them fix the problems they don't even know about. Because enterprises, they don't do password audits. It's like when I go in there and I do a pen test, I'm the one that tells them what their Unix admins are doing. Because you can't go to a Unix admin and like hold her beard and be like, tell me your password. <laughs> you know, you can't do that. If they don't have a beard, they're on Windows. <laughs> so anyway, um, I totally like shade this morning. It's a little hard. Um, oh, so, so my point is thanks to everyone because like, look at this, we're sitting in a room. Like, the, where are the ones that are doing it? We have authors of the tools here and stuff like that. Um, and, like, the, the techniques that we're doing and, like, everyone's sharing. That's the big thing with Cracking If You Can was we required at the very beginning, and I don't know what year it was, 2010, was we required the winning teams in order to get my hard-earned money. We required them to write up how they did it. And this is why. Because I wanted to grow. I put in things this year. Like, the last example, last year we did Sun in 5 And the reason we did that is because I'm a dick. 
Because I knew that you could only crack some MD5s on a Solaris machine with a proper library. So everyone's like, how the heck do you crack these? I'm like, dude, it's polished. I'm like, yeah, no tool does it. And I'm like, hey, I know. Now, there's multiple tools that crack some MD5. Well, guess what I'm doing this year? I'm doing more of that because I want the tools to improve. You know? And, and honestly, I, um, just tell me to shut up because I will, I will talk for hours. Uh, an example, I'm at Techno Forensics Conference years ago. Oh, I don't want to do a while and take my pants off. Um, <laughs> no, pictures, pictures. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I'm at Techno Forensics Conference. It's, it, it's a semi technical conference with forensics guys. 80% of the people there are cops, are feds. And so many of them are forensics guys. I get it. These two guys come up from uh, a county in Georgia, and they're like, "Hey, uh, talk to us about DMG, okay? They're child porn investigators, and they're like, we busted this guy. His wife turned him in. He's going to jail. We have him on three. They found three images in his disk cache that were deleted, but they were pulled because they're forensics guys. So he's going to jail on three counts. The thing is, when you find something like that, that's three separate charges." On his laptop, they found a like two gig file, and it was called corruptedfiles.dmg, and it had a password on it. And they were like, help. Now, this was like in 09, okay? And I had to be like, uh, I can write you a bash script that'll do like one a second. And the thing is, they had all these old passwords, and it didn't crack the DMG. And they knew that, like, if that DMG, I'm pretty sure it wasn't corrupted files. I mean, this is a convicted pedophile, okay? So they got real, real, really quick, okay? So what eventually did I do in practice if you can? I put encrypted DMGs in there because I wanted the tools to be able to do that specifically so that I could help these guys. So like, you know, we're not all bad guys. You know, we are, I mean, uh, the, the, you know, I mean, I was talking to Gossi, they're, they're doing password cracking as a service as well. Uh, you do a lot of forensic stuff. When you're doing forensics jobs and people are doing incident response, those are bad guys, you know? It, and, and sometimes they're bad, bad guys. So using everything we learn, it can be used for good. You know, it can be used. I would love to crack that DMG and get that child porn guy. And I know that's really, not really quiet because it's really serious, but like, it's still a human choosing a password. And so in forensics cases, I mean, you know, a bad guy comes around and crypts something, and ha ha ha, look what I did. You know, you, you can use the same logic, the same everything to, for the power of good. So uh, as much as we all love pasting and, and, and getting those large leaks, and for, and for God's sakes, please keep doing it. Uh, you know the worst thing that, uh, I told you I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna shut up. The, uh, the worst thing that's happened in the password cracking community this year, uh, paste2.org, they changed their, uh, when you make a pass, it used to be a sequential number. They changed it and made it random. So you can no longer run a script that just goes and does 10 at a time, 10 at a time, and get all the pack, all the pastes. Uh, they made it random. That's like the worst thing, because all of a sudden, you no longer find paste to uh, password leaks on there. Uh, and that's, um, you know, and uh, everyone knows about last.fm. It was from Inside Pro, it was where it was leaked. Um, uh, and now all of a sudden inside Pro's forums, people are a little more scared to post there. So that was an, uh, an unfortunate outcome of, of last.fm. Finger on the nose, okay, for everybody. So, uh, any questions? I, like I said, I will just talk and talk and talk. Yes, but. So what, I mean, given that we've been trying all of this password complexity rules and everything else for the last five, 10 years, people know that passwords matter and we can still beat on, you know, beat on them like a pinata. Where do you see things going? I mean, are, are we just, do you think that we're gonna be able to get off of passwords at some point, or new algorithms, or where do you see it going? It's, I'm, I'm glad I don't work in enterprise, because they, they, they cannot change their tools, you know? And so, every place I know is yeah, just like, like, boy, I wish I worked at RSA. So many places are going to factor. So many admins are going to factor. It's just like they see it as the only way of doing it. That's it's, it. It just sucks, you know. Uh, you know, well, we. I mean, we use two factor at our company, and you know, there's no passwords. Go ahead and compromise machine. There's no passwords. It's all you know. It's all SSH keys and blah blah. blah. The, my point is that you too know what's wrong. You have to audit. You have. I hate using the A word. Um, audit. It's like a bad word in my household. Um, 
you have to audit. Enterprises don't know what their users are doing wrong. They're, they're not particular. Unless I show up and do a, a, a hack or you know a penetration test or a real pen tester shows up and does a real pen test and performs that audit, they don't know. So like they're still in baby steps. They still think what they're doing is working. Okay? Uh, I mean so I still see growth before we even get into new technologies, I see I still see growth that needs to be done in the enterprise world to to you know to make our users smarter. I mean, how many websites that you go to have password complexity requirements? Okay, think about, think of percentage in your, 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 your cynical brain. What, how many of those websites five years ago had password complexity requirements? How long is that going to be acceptable? You know, is that, you know, how long is it going to be acceptable that we allow our users to sign up for a PayPal account and, and choose a crappy password? You know, that, that's got to improve. We're still, we're still in the baby step stage. I'm done. Question? Yeah, yeah. Um, in the major password cracking programs out there, what type of hashes are not supported right now that you think should be supported? Well, <laughs> tomorrow. I right there too, so I mean, it's not. You'll find out tomorrow. Yeah, you'll find out tomorrow. You'll find out tomorrow at 11:59 p.m. <laughs> uh, as a penetration tester, I see certain things that are just going to see obscure, and, and, and you're like, "This is bullshit." He's just being mean. Uh, there are programs that have certain ways. Um, the progress in the last two years has been amazing. I mean, it's to the point where, like, I would bitch and moan to Adam because I couldn't. To crack the salted shaws from an LDAP database, I'd have to convert them. I'd have to de-base 64, which turns them into a binary salt. So, like, it, they, don't, they don't all fit on a single line because some of the salts have binary high ASCII. Uh, you know, and now it's built in support and it just works. And it's a thousand times faster than John. Zing! Um, <laughs> So like, good question. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not. Gonna, but, but the thing is, like, what's missing is shrinking so much that like seven of us are sitting in a room going, okay, how can we fuck with these guys? <laughs> you know. And I've got one. One of the challenges this year, you, you, you're not going to be able to crack it. But it's just going to take. It's going to take a dev about ten minutes to figure out where is this from, what is it. It says right in there what it is, and to implement it. And if they implement it. They're even going to ask Lord once, because the goal of cracking if you can is to improve the community, is to improve the tool sets, to improve the rules, is to improve the knowledge. Yeah, it's also to laugh at your failures, <laughs> um, which is fun for me. And then, and then uh, the side, the side point of the contest is to force everyone to learn BGP, which is the biggest complaint. We require everyone to use BGP, and no one uses it. So it was. Thanks a lot. I'm Rick. I'm Mika. I'm Crappy if you can. Oh, I have a...